Um, next on the agenda, we have Peddler. I heard Peddler, the first, I think it might have been the first time or one of the early times of his getting up to talk at um, Stone Soup Poetry. And I was struck with his entrance on the stage and just knocked my socks off with what he had to say. And uh, so Peddler is an editor of Whale Magazine. And he has recently published his chapbook, Peddler Roadhouse Poet, Across an Urban Waste. Peddler believes writers are artists and deserve recognition and strive through Whale Magazine, Whale Coffee House, as well as his television program, North Shore Cultural Safari, to give his fellow writer that recognition. He is at present studying literary journalism at Harvard University and is researching the bohemian roots of our present literary movement for a future publication. Would you all please give a warm welcome to Pendler. technical jobs like pumping gas and washing dishes and I found I wasn't any good at all that paperwork so I had to do something so I decided to go to college. And, uh, you know what people always say, I had to do it over again. I do I did. I decided I did it over again. <laughs> His name was, I named him after the religious leader. His name was Rescue. And um, he, he was, you know, he was a good dog. You know, he bit people and stuff. He was kind of, it, he, like, I don't know if he like, he bit the dog catcher, of all the people on the planet to bite. He bit my old lady's kid. Like, and, and they said, oh, the dog attacked my kid. And what it really was, was the kid had a peanut butter sandwich and the dog wanted it. So the dog took it and the kid took it back. And the dog took it and the kid took it. And finally, the, you know, the dog had enough and took it. Back. And like, uh, so, and then when he finally died, like, put him dying, like, um, like, you know, the made a law, just about every place on the planet, everything's against the law. I don't know if anybody's keeping the score. But it, it was like, they made this law, like, you can't just, you have to dispose of your animals properly. You can't bury them. But I buried him in the woods, and it was like, all these citizens I had taken by the house, and I put them in the radio flyer wagon, and I, like, dragged them down, you know what I mean? To, like, everybody thought I was taking them for a ride, but it was dead. <laughs> But he's resting up in the woods now. Name of this is a dog's moor. Yeah, a dog's moor than hairballs in the rug. More than yellow stains on the carpet. Yeah, a dog's more than how growl snap. Yeah, a dog's more than scratching at the door. A rap tap tapping on the door jam with a stupid tail. Yeah, a dog's more than unkept fuzz, or clapping across tile kitchen floors. Yeah, a dog's more than a late, late night walk of miserable midnight puppy farts. Yeah, a dog's more. He's a force of being to be reckoned with. And when they're there, they're there. And when they're gone, they're gone. And that's when you really know a dog's more. <laughs> There was this guy up back and he shouted, Slow down, slow down, and I thought he shouted, Get down, get down, I was trying to read faster, so I didn't yell at him. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the homes. Yeah, yeah, the homeless, the homeless need beds. And sometimes they get beds, but when they don't get it, it's no rest. Yeah, think about it, think about it. Every day, I'm walking around, walking around. No place to lie down, no place to sit down and keep you moving, yeah. And when you, you, you can make you could hide in an alley where they might find your head squished by the bug. Yeah, or sometimes you can sleep behind cardboard boxes. But think about every day, lying up and down, walking around, walking around, and you try to stop the tape, keep on moving. Yeah, if you can sleep in a shelter, but you know, like, you gotta stay awake all night worrying about what the next guy is gonna do here next year. You know what I mean? You can, like, walk around, every day, walk around. You know what I mean? Sure, you could try in that house, and some guys go that way, but you know, like, now all they do is drug you and throw you back out on the street, and you end up walking around with a smile like a Kool-Aid jug, while some guy jumps on a fast train back to suburbia with a pocket full of money as a therapist, and you get to shuffle your way back to the homeless shelter. But you still need a place to lay down. <laughs> One of uh, the first 
courses I had in college this lady. I'm basically illiterate, which makes it hard, but it doesn't make it impossible. <laughs> this is America, you know what I mean? And, and I like that, you know, this is America. But this lady, like I had her as an instructor, and she basically wanted to fail me, like, uh, because she, she couldn't read my writing. So the first poem I gave to her was like, was written on insanity and death and, and violence, and it was written from this side of the book in, and she never bothered me again. <laughs> Yeah, a long time ago, I'm working in this rural garage, and I see the boss's cat from waltzing across the grass pile of the wrecking yard, and this guy sees got something in his mouth. It's a mouse. He drops this mouse down and starts to let it run away, and then he passes down beside it. I think he must need therapy something, being into all this S&M violence trip, you know, even abuse. I say, and he was, but the mouse don't look so bad, man. He's squeaking like real mad, but he, he don't look so bad. He ain't bloody or nothing. He's just all cat droll. So I runs in the garage, and I scoops up a tin can and a piece of cardboard, and I runs back out to the yard, and I steps between the cat and the mouse, and I scoops up the mouse and the tin can, and I puts the cardboard cover over it, and I walks over to a little stone wall and lets the mouse go down in the crack and disappear. Now who knows if this mouse got caught the very next day, or he got back, or he stayed and lived to be a ripe old age of old books on a deal with psychopathic cats. And who knows if this was fate's way of aggravating a cat, or like a mouse praying antsy. But it does give me hope with all the bad cats we gotta deal with, because the mice still might be out there praying. <laughs> You know, every day you get up and you get a little older. I don't know if anybody noticed it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like you try to lift things, like, you know what I mean? And, and they're a little bit heavier than they used to be. You know, and, and you want to jack up the thermostat a little bit higher. I, I don't know if anybody here can identify with that. They say there ain't nothing wrong with getting older, but I know my grandmother died of an overdose of birthdays. You know what I mean? I watched her. Grow up. You know, and, and being, being the dude I am, it kind of makes me nervous because, like, uh, the men in my family don't mature until they're 35 or 40. And then they get seen out of 40. And they don't leave a whole big strip, you know what I mean? But one day I snowed into this dude, and he, and he like, he told me, he says, uh, he says, welcome to middle age. And I thought about it, welcome to middle age. Waking up middle age in a moment of confusion. Waking up middle age in a moment of loneliness. It's realizing you can't pay your brother off body that got $5 on him because he's dead. It's going to the house where you grew up in and finding it gone. It's realizing all those guests you wish were dead are dead. Waking up middle age and forgetting the cat's name. You're already on those six generations of felines, and every one of them's taking a piece of your heart. Waking up middle age is realizing your kid friends, kids you thought were almost 12 or past 20. And damn it, the 12 year old kid looks and acts the same, and you wonder why nature keeps making them. Because they keep wearing out. Making up middle age is hearing some young and hip dude 17 or so telling this date that we can ask that old dude over the end and realize they're pointing towards you. <laughs> Waking up middle age is wishing that you'd never made the mail that letter in 69 or you answered that letter to 72. Or how about the phone call in 79? You should have answered the damn thing. And how about 1981? You didn't have to be so hot. You could at least wave goodbye. Now you don't even have a snapshot in your mind. Waking up middle age and seeing the sail on flea calls and realizing that the dog's gone and now you got a wizard doors all the time. Waking up middle age is waking up with the poems of lost poems from the tip of your, your, your youth on the tip of your mind and you leap up to write it down and they smoke it gone. So instead you write a poem about waking up 